Hey, it doesn't matter if you are an influencer or somebody who's growing your business with social media. You need to start focusing on what is going to actually attract the people you want to reach. And that's why you need to listen carefully to what my guest today has to say. Adriana Tika is on a mission to help fellow businesses and brands build and scale the right way. With a wealth of experience over multiple industries, Adriana is dropping some serious gems in this podcast interview about the business of content creation. Look, I know you are so over the endless stream of tricks and promises of overnight success and the latest this or that that you're bombarded with every single day, and you just want some real marketing and growth advice. I got you. Hello, I want to welcome Adriana Tika to my podcast today. Adriana, I'm so glad to meet you, and I'm so glad that you've agreed to be on my podcast. I think we're going to have a really interesting discussion today about the business of content creation. I'm really excited to hear your insights, to kind of go back and forth with you about some of the things we talked about in the past. But to get started, I'm wondering if you would tell my audience who you are, brief introduction, kind of what your role is and how you got into this world of digital marketing and content creation. Hey, Tony, thank you for having me. I run a digital marketing agency and I'm also a content creator. I wear many hats and I'm very, very proud of them all. So I've been running my agency for uh, eight or nine years now. I've almost forgotten. And um, at a certain point, I decided that I want to build something that allows me to use my voice without a brand name, just under under my own name. I wanted to talk about the things that matter to me, uh, the way I, uh, the way that matter to me, you know, to use a personal voice rather than a brand voice, a face and not a logo, if that makes sense. So I got into the content creation game. I've built a newsletter called Ideas to Power Your Future, which is how we met uh, yes. through my newsletter. And these days I support um, entrepreneurs and content creators and solopreneurs to build an online presence and build their own marketing strategy without the usual BS you see online. You know the type. Um, make 10K a day by working mm. 10 minutes a day overnight mm. if possible. So uh, you and I both know that's not possible, but it is possible to build a business that's fueled by, <clears throat> by your presence on social media and non-social media <clears throat> platforms. And this is exactly what I do in my in my consulting work. Well, I love that uh, that perspective, and also I love that and you've been doing it pros. for uh, several years, ten years, nine or ten years, and that's about how long I've been actually in the role that I'm in. And so I'm wondering, how have you seen the landscape of digital marketing change in the past ten years? Well, do you have a couple of hours? To that? Yes, I do. <laughs> So uh, my first uh, business in the digital space was mostly centered around SEO and content writing. When I got started, keyword stuffing and writing a blog post that mm. was basically illegible by humans was still a big thing. You know, there, there's a joke uh, with an SEO expert who walks into a bar, a pub, a restaurant. <laughs> that was pretty much what we used to uh, to write some 10 to 15 years ago, maybe. In the meantime, to sum this up as, uh, as much as possible, the, uh, the digital marketing landscape has changed and it has become more human-centric, more user-centric. Following the lead of SEO, we see this shift in, even in business-to-business -business relations, for instance. People now want to do business with a face, not a logo. Mm -hmm which is what prompted the rise of content creators, especially in the B2B space. Um, up until a couple of years ago, you saw the likes of Elon Musk, Mark Zuckerberg, who also created content online to fuel their businesses. But most people used to think that this is something that's reserved for um, large business owners, for Fortune 500 companies. These days, that's no longer true. It's it's actually the opposite. If you if you want to fuel your own business, you better put yourself out there and you better start creating content that allows people to know you, that allows people to know the people behind the logos. And it's been in in the past years, it's been the easiest way to get business at any level, from the beginning freelancer to uh, an established local business owner who, who simply wants to expand. 
I have so much to say about that. When you just sparked my memory, when you said the, the SEO hack set used to be used, uh, say 15 years ago. Remember when you used to search on Google, you're looking for something very legitimate. And you find these blog posts that are like, what in the world is going on here? Because there was this big push for backlinking. My audience may not yeah. be old enough or have been around <laughs> long enough to remember this, but there's these backlinking things. And I might say, I had a, a diet website back in the day and um, I may have used some of those tactics to rank my site to number one, <laughs> but <laughs> for a brief period of time. But well, now you say that I think we broke the internet. Well, yeah, uh, I won't call it black hat. I'll call it light gray hat <laughs> tactics for SEO. SEO uh, reigns supreme on the internet. Uh, and you were just saying that, you know, business owners need to put their face out there. They need to, because people want to do business with a person and not a logo. And so many, I have quite a few business owners reach out to me and say that they want to be create content on social media, but they don't want to show their face and <laughs> they don't want to show their face. And I'm not sure what, what that is all about. Well, I do know it. it's sometimes it's insecurity, but I will tell you this just in my own, you probably have way more experience with this than I do, but in my own experience, some clients that I've worked with a particular client was not, was did very well, not showing her face. She was showing her work, which was, um, which is, designs of a particular type of building. And she had really cool animated videos of this, this design. And she says, I don't want to show my face. You know, I don't like the way I look on camera. You know, I don't like my voice. I'm older, I'm this, I'm that. And I said, girl, get in front of that camera. She started doing live streams uh, about her technique and she blew up. She blew up because by interacting, as you said, people got to put a face with that brand and there's no stopping her now. So mm -hmm. I guess that, but, but, and then here's my, here's where I'm going to bring it back around again. Nowadays with the onset of AI, there are so many, because I, my, my main realm is YouTube, although I do dabble in Instagram and TikTok, there is an, an upsurge of faceless channels again. Yeah. with AI generated content and AI generated voice. What do you think about that? I think these, uh, these AI generated videos are going to keep popping up. It's the same for written content. AI has commoditized much of the content we see online, which is why I want to reinforce your point about how important it is to show your actual face and to make your actual voice heard, because this is something that AI can't do. And when you're looking to expand a business, any business, in marketing, we talk a lot about leading with outcome. Tell people what they get out of working with you. And that's a very good piece of advice. On the other hand, in the crowded markets, if you have a lot of competitors, there are also other points of differentiation. It's not just about the outcome. A lot of people can be great designers, like, like the example you gave, but it's also about how you work with a certain person what their personality is, do their values match with yours? And these are important things for your audience because irrespective of the outcome, I also want to enjoy working with you, you know, and it helps if I get to know you. It helps if I, if I see the way you smile, the way you connect with people, if you talk about your principles, about what drives you in business. And, uh, and yeah, this is why in the, world of, uh, in the world of AI and in competitive landscapes, showing your own voice and your own face are, are more important than ever. The same goes for writing. If you, if you write bland articles and bland blog posts, like four ways to uh, fix your sink, AI can do that. You no longer need to, uh, to create that content manually, but opinion pieces, personality infused pieces, those are at a premium today. Absolutely. Absolutely. I feel personally, when you see someone's face, especially on, on video, and you're hearing their voice, you can say to yourself, oh, I can see myself working with them. Or you could say, you know, that doesn't look like the right match for me. And that's yeah. fine. Let's get that out of the way first. If you don't like my personality, if you don't like the way I'm coming across on camera, then it's possible that we're not a good fit. But it's also a way to figure out if you are a good fit. So I want to, one of the 
uh, first introductions I had to you was reading your uh, newsletter. And in the intro of one of your newsletters, you had asked a question about, are you a content creator or a business owner? I think that's the way that you put it. I would love to get into that because I'm thinking of a situation that happened recently with my daughter. And I, I've already explained to you that she is a content creator and who, what you would call a an influencer, I suppose, because most of her income comes from representing brands online and sometimes in person. So she was uh, invited to a brand event for a particular product and we're going to show off this product. And it happened to be at a very organic gathering, say it was a dinner, dinner party, an event. And she was only one of two quote unquote influencers who were at this event. And the purpose was to show off this brand's product. And she sat down with a group of people who were not young, you know, my daughter's 30, so they weren't 30 and under. They were mature people. And the conversation went to, what do you do? And actually, I don't think that was the first question. The conversation, the conversation went to how they hated content creation, how they really couldn't, social media, it was social media. My God, I hate social media. Oh, I can't stand social media. I'm never on social media. This is the conversation going on around the table. And then the question was posed to her. So what do you do? And she <laughs> said, well, I'm in social media. And they, you know, that disdain that some people have when we talk about content creation, I know we're not just, we think about social media, but content is a newsletter content is a blog post. I mean, that's still social media, but let's talk about why, especially people in my age range, or maybe even a little younger who haven't grown up with the internet, feel some kind of way about social media and content creation. I, I see this, um, this disdain very prevalent with traditional business owners or indeed perhaps the older generations, although the newer generations start to uh, start to uh, get in on this disdain bandwagon as well. It's probably because we associate influencers with uh, superficial values. Uh, we think about beauty influencers and people like Kim Kardashian, and we don't want to be associated with those people. Though successful influencers, even if uh, they're not in the B2B space, they have incredible business acumen. Even Kim Kardashian, I mean, love her or hate her, it, it doesn't matter mm -hmm. what your personal opinion is about her. She has built a, a business empire. I'm I'm going to try and keep this PG-13. I'm, I'm going <laughs> to gloss over how she got her start. But I'm just oh. going to say that a lot of people try to start that way, but very few of them have uh, an eight-figure business empire. I do believe she's at eight-figure now, so uh, maybe I'm wrong. Anyway. Mm -hmm. I think that the lines are more and more blurred these days. You see people like uh, like Bill Gates, like Elon Musk, um, Gary Vaynerchuk, all of mm. them create content and they run Fortune 500 businesses as well. Mm -hmm. More often than not, more than one business at the same time. So uh, I don't know how they feel about this label, about the label of uh, content creator, but this is what they do. And this is what... Uh, successful smaller business owners do as well. They know that they need to get in front of their audience. They can no longer hide behind their work. And I'm telling you this fully knowing that I used to be one of those people. I never had no. the disdain for influencers because I worked with them and I know the amount of work they have to put in to get to where they are and um, the, strategy, the strategizing they need to do. But I, um, I didn't do a a photo shoot until 2022 when I decided to launch my newsletter. I was still on my, I had social media profiles. I was using them to get business for my agency, but my photo was like 10 years old, taken in a park. <laughs> because, you know, uh, I'm a writer and I some, sometimes hide behind my keyboard. I still believe that I'm better in writing uh, than, on, than on video. But here I am putting myself out there because I know how important it is to push your own boundaries and to let people know you in more than one form. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned Gary V, Gary Vaynerchuk. I've been following him for a while. That's another love him or hate him. The man has never been yeah. wrong about social media. 
and business. And he speaks to Fortune 500, Fortune 100 companies, and he's been preaching this for years. You guys have got to get in front of your audiences on social media before it's too late. And I know for a fact that before I even dipped my toe into TikTok, he was telling business owners, you need to be on TikTok. One of the social media managers I was friends with said, oh no, that platform is just for people who are dancing and singing. It's for the younger audience. At the same time, Gary Vee was saying, listen, your audience is going to be on TikTok. Get out there ahead of the game. When I told one of my clients that her competitors were on TikTok and she had just gotten on into Instagram, she's like, what's that? I was like, I spelled it for her and I said, do the same type of engagement and content creation you're doing on Instagram. And three years later, she has almost 700,000 followers on TikTok as a business creator. And she loves to say, and I'm not even singing or dancing. So uh, yeah. it's something that I think businesses are slow. And, you know, we're talking about Fortune 500, Fortune 100, but even small businesses, even mom and especially mom and pop businesses or solopreneurs should be figuring out a way to have some sort of social media presence. There, These people who say, oh, I'm not on social media. I'm like, what are you doing? What are you doing? How are you finding information? How are you managing in life? Do you just wait until an ad shows up on television to figure out <laughs> where you kind of buy something or spend your dollars? Or maybe they're just saying that. Maybe they mean they don't spend hours mindless scrolling. And I can understand yeah. that. But yeah. but it's a flex, you know? I don't need social media. I'm too good. Yes, <laughs> you're right. So I wanted to find out, speaking of that, and I'm wondering if you have any advice for someone, let's just say a business owner who wants to use social media or use content creation to kind of build their business or to grow their business. What would your main piece of advice be? I've, uh, I've discussed this many times in uh, my strategy sessions mm -hmm. with my clients because a lot of them are scared, you know, to start and they are especially scared to diversify into multiple platforms. So the first piece of advice is find the format you're most comfortable with. If it's text, then go to LinkedIn or X. If it's video, you have TikTok and YouTube. If it's um, pictures, you've got Instagram and Pinterest to some degree. Mm -hmm. Pinterest is not, I mean, not exactly a social media network, also a, mm -hmm. a search engine. It's a pretty cross between the two. Mm -hmm. So first things first, find the format you're most comfortable with. <clears throat> Typically, it's either video or text. And from there on, you can start to diversify very easily. If you're on YouTube, for instance, uh, you can break down longer videos into YouTube shorts that you can also post as Instagram Reels or TikTok. So you've got one piece of uh, foundational content that you can repurpose multiple ways across platforms. But the, the key point is to start with something that you are comfortable with because otherwise you're going to give up way too soon. Social media reach, organic reach is not what it used to be across platforms. Um, it's uh, it's the law of social media and certification when platforms start by being good to the users uh, just to attract more users. Then they want to monetize their platforms. So they start being bad to the users, but good to advertisers. Then they want more money from the advertisers. So not even the ads are working. And uh, then it's the RIP stage where a platform either changes completely, reinvents itself, or it dies off as it happened with MySpace. Mm -hmm. uh, but in but right now we're in an era where organic reach isn't easy to come by on any platform. It used to be on TikTok. TikTok was the last uh, uh, the last stronghold of organic reach. Even even there, things are things are harder these days. So it's very important to find something that you enjoy doing, something that you're comfortable with because it's going to take time to build an audience and to make sure that that audience is relevant. Absolutely. I love that advice. 
I think that is awesome to start off where it's easier for you. Uh, do you recommend that um, business content creators just focus on one platform or do you recommend they start off with two? There's a, there's a, a school of thought that says be everywhere. <laughs> and I'm not sure I, I don't agree. Actually, I don't agree with that. It's impossible. But what do you think about that? It's impossible in the beginning, definitely. And if you try to be everywhere in the very beginning, you're going to stretch yourself too thin. You're not going to get any result and you're going to burn out. So start with one platform, master that, but then diversify. Because if you're on a single platform, especially if it's a platform you don't control, like social media, you don't have a business, you have a funnel. So my advice is start on social media as a discovery platform, as Jay Klaus puts it. Mm -hmm. Allow people to discover you, then funnel those people into a platform that you can control, which is most often email. On email, you you, de you decide who gets what emails, uh, who can see your promos, who can be deleted from your list. On social media, you can't do that. And then diversify into multiple social media platforms. Again, because you don't control the algorithms, you don't know when a social media platform will shut down your account, and mm -hmm. you need a plan B. You need to be elsewhere. I, I worked with clients who had their LinkedIn accounts shut, for instance. Uh, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm very active on LinkedIn. And they wrote me to tell me, thank you for forcing me to build an email list because I've been without LinkedIn for two weeks. I would have been dead in the water without an email list. But mm -hmm. at least I had something to focus on while oh, while I fixed my issue with LinkedIn support. So absolutely diversify. I I believe in the doctrine of uh, building a media empire. The goal is to be on as many platforms as possible. But this is not a tenable goal in the first year or in the first few years. You can't do this uh, on a one-person team. You need a large team with uh, different areas of expertise. You need people who are good with videos, people who are excellent graphic designers, people who can edit things on the fly. If you give me a reel to edit on my phone, you might as well kill me. I couldn't edit it to save my life. <laughs> <laughs> so you need, you need a larger team. The more you expand, the bigger your team is going to need to be. But that doesn't mean that you shouldn't diversify because platforms come and go. The organic reach comes and goes. You need to be on multiple platforms also because uh, the more people see you, the more they will believe in you as an authority. I don't know if this ever happened to you. I know it happened to me a few times. I look at I look at someone's post on LinkedIn or on X, and then I see them on YouTube. I see them on Instagram, and I'm like, bloody hell, this guy is everywhere. There, there must be something about them. Yeah. Even though working in this industry, I know that this is how algorithms work. They, yeah. they track the cookies, they track my behavior. So yes. I know that I, I, I watched Tony's video on YouTube, then I'm going to see your videos on Instagram, whether I yes. follow you or not. Yes. And one more point, and then I promise I, I'll shut up on this topic. No, it's keep talking, deeply, keep talking. <laughs> it's something I'm deeply passionate about. Yes. Uh, it's, uh, you know, given the organic reach that I mentioned maybe 10 times until now, Mm -hmm. People aren't going to see your stuff uh, on every platform, whether they follow you there or not. So mm -hmm. if you're on Instagram or LinkedIn, maybe 1% of your audience is going to see one of your posts. But if you get them to also subscribe to your newsletter, you have another chance to target them with your message there. If they follow you on TikTok, YouTube, and on Instagram, maybe they'll see your latest video on one of these platforms at mm -hmm. the very least. Because people don't log in everywhere around the same time on the same day. And again, organic reach is not your friend. So mm -hmm. uh, even it's not just about being on multiple platforms to attract different people who prefer different formats. It's also about uh, making sure that every member of your audience follows you on as many platforms as possible. Awesome. I, you know what? When you said that, that's one of the points that I don't think I drive home to my clients as much about how the organic, I'm, I'm going to put that on the t-shirt, organic reach is not your friend. So, but I've noticed, you know, if I start posting, take, you know, super consistent, consistent, people will tell me, people that I know in real life will just say, oh, I've been seeing you everywhere. And I'm like, really? Because, you know, I was only really being consistent 
in the past few days on this platform. It's like, oh, I'm just seeing your stuff everywhere. And that's why the algorithm knows. So just like they know I looked at those shoes yesterday and they keep popping that, <laughs> that ad up for those shoes. And I think yep. that most content creators, whether they are influencers or business owners, don't really get that. And that's why a lot of my work is just to educate them on how the algorithm works. Even some YouTube creators will believe that because they have subscribers, that the person that is subscribed to their channel is just going to be served every single video that they make. And that's not true. This is just a misconception. Well, I have followers. Well, did you, <laughs> I'll just, I don't want to rat my mother out. My mother is 87 and she's on social media oh, wow. for a while. <laughs> So, no, I didn't get her started. She did that all on her own. But she um, was saying, she would say to me, maybe Facebook was her, her platform. And we follow some of the same people because of the community and friends and family and stuff. And she'll say, did you see on Facebook today where so-and-so did such and such? And I was like, no, mom, I didn't see that. <laughs> Why didn't, you know, she's like, well, we follow the same people. Why didn't you see the same thing? Because I may not be, you know, you know, I don't have to explain it to you, but... She just didn't get it. It's like everybody, or I would have a friend on Facebook who would say, I'm just not going to post on Facebook anymore because none of you people ever comment on my posts. Well, honey, it's because we didn't see it. We, we didn't see it. And so some business owners especially feel like they're spamming if they post frequently. They hold back from posting frequently because they're like, well, I just posted yesterday and I want to post again. And just not understanding that not everybody sees everything. And as a matter of fact, probably very little of your content is being seen. Absolutely. And this is also a good argument for reusing some of your best performing posts and ideas because people didn't see it the first time. And even those who saw it, they forgot all about it right now. I know this may sound harsh, but nobody cares about your content as much as you do. And Ooh. you can see this is harsh, but you can also see it as liberating because it doesn't mean it has to be perfect every time. There's a little something called the Bradfall effect uh, that tells us that people love imperfect things more than perfect things because to polish is slippery, you know. But if you have the occasional typo in your emails, if you stutter on video the way I do, if you haven't mm. noticed yet. Uh, you're, uh, you're human, you're relatable, they, they do those things as well. And, uh, and so knowing that your content isn't the most important thing in your audience's life can be liberating and it will also allow you to reuse it as often as possible. We're not content creation machines. The standards for content right now are insanely high and you cannot be expected to have a brilliant idea three times a week just to feed the insatiable algorithm, you know? So reuse some of your best performing posts. Yes. My, uh, my go-to is if it's three months or, or older, I'm going to reuse it because I have new followers, new email subscribers, new people who haven't seen it, and a lot of people who have seen it but have completely forgotten about it because they have their own content to worry about. Yes, yes. And that, got, that you just answered my next question because I was going to ask you about strategies for growth. <laughs> Uh, you know, organically, <laughs> you just shared the whole kaboot right there. That's, that's it. If you have anything else, do tell, because I'm, you know, as much time as I spend in this space, I learn every day. And I think it's really important for people to, who are interested in digital marketing or content creation or influencing to constantly kind of educate themselves and to stay up. You can't stay up on every single trend, but you can you know, keep your e eyes open and your ears open to new strategies, what's going on, what's best to do now. So you have any other juicy tips that you want to share for increasing engagement? That <laughs> engagement is a big thing that people ask about. Like, how do I get engagement up? The best way to get engagement is to have a controversial stance on something. Ooh. So if you can spark controversy, you're going to get engagement. The, uh, the platform here is irrelevant. It works on, on everything. I think it still works on MySpace if someone's still into that. But if you, if you have a controversial idea, this is going to get you engagement and it's going to get you a lot of new social media. 
Now, the downside of uh, controversial stances is that you can't do them every day. You're no. just going to be a negative Nelly, a naysayer. <laughs> you, you can't just write against something. You have to you have to also stand for something. You have to have your own ideas, you know? It's like um, you can't be a demolition company. You can be a builder, someone who has to tear down an old house to build a, a new house, a better house, but you have to have the... the um, the building side of things as well. You can't just tear down ideas and people all the time. And since we we got to tearing down, another thing that I'd be very wary of when starting a controversy online is that it's always a better idea to uh, attack ideas, not people. If you start mm-hmm. attacking people, you're going to look petty. It's a jerk move, and mm-hmm. people see that people can see that you're doing this just to increase your own your own clout. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's not something you want to be known for. You want to be known for uh, having your own ideas, for having a spine, and for standing for what you believe in and what you you are against. I see a lot of people, both in business, both on the business and the creator side, and a lot of them in the middle, of course, who tend to resort to bland content because they don't want to offend anyone. They don't want to leave anyone out. But here's the thing, if you're for everyone, you're for no one. Mm. So don't be afraid to talk about your values. This is what gets you engagement. This is, <laughs> no, it's actually more important than that. It's what gets mm. you engagement from people that matter, from people that are going to be your friends, your partners, your voice amplifiers. If your content is bland, you know, there's something I keep seeing on, on LinkedIn and Twitter. People uh, use motivational posts like, Oh, you just have to get started. I'm sorry, but that's bullshit. I mean, yeah, sure, of course you have to get started. You have to. Otherwise, no one's going to see you. But it's so far from enough. You don't have to just get started. There are millions of people getting started every day. No one hears of them after a month or so. There's um, there's a science and an art to balancing radical and new ideas with uh, inspirational content, with supportive content. You have to have all of them. It's uh, it's not just uh, one type of content that's going to get you there, that's going to get you engagement, followers, and ultimately business, whatever that means for you. However, all of these types of content lie firmly on your foundation, a foundation that has to be made of your own values. If if you don't have your own values, if you don't have something to, uh, to stand up for, you're not going to have a voice of your own. You're just going to be like ChatGPT, who essentially mm. uh, spins existing content and spews right advice. So figure out what you believe in first and lead with that. Oh, I, I'm sorry I for love the long run. <laughs> no, I love that. Figure out what you believe in and start with that. And then two, how does that fit with audience? So there's what you believe in. And hopefully that's resonating with your audience because maybe it's, uh, they have similar values. Um, I just, I have uh, some of the, biz- even business owners that I work with haven't figured out their audience. When you ask them, you know, who their audience is, they're just, you know, when you say you, you reach everyone, you're reaching no one. Oh, it's like everyone who, no, that's not exactly it. So how does content creation, creating from a place of your own values also connect to your audience and what they believe in? That's a very loaded question. (laughs) (laughs) Because uh, there are two schools of thought. One that tells you to niche down until you can't niche no more. You have Mm -hmm. this insane business uh, bios that say, I do yoga for people between 42 and 45 who live in this tiny neighborhood. <laughs> okay, how long is how, how big is your total address? <laughs> yeah, 24 people. Exactly. And then there there's a school of thought that tells you to go to go broad. As always, I believe that uh, the key is balance. You need to find um, if you following up on the yoga example. If you if you're a yoga teacher, for instance. Does it make sense to only target women? Does it make sense to put in uh, to put in uh, an age label to to the women that you target? Is your business location dependent? You have to figure out the answer the answers to those questions before you can you can say who your audience is. Because what I've seen with my own clients is that they they listen to the niche down advice 
so deeply that their audience is incredibly tiny and mm -hmm. you have so many resources at your disposal. I mean, look for how many women in their 40s are there in a, in a neighborhood of Dallas, Texas. This is your starting point. How many are there? And then how many of them can you realistically target and then convert into clients? Assume that there, some of them hate yoga. Others can't do yoga for medical reasons. Others already have a yoga teacher that they love and they wouldn't change for the world. Start there, figure out how big the addressable market is, and then you'll know if you need to niche down further so that you appeal to their values and their credos, and maybe they can identify with you. You have the same gender, you have the same music preferences, or perhaps you need to expand. You need to be, okay, it's both men and women, you know? So mm -hmm. um, I think this is a question that, varies a lot from business to business. Mm -hmm. Some businesses can thrive on a super tiny audience. And that's usually the case when they sell high ticket products or services. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. if you sell something that's more affordable, you're going to need a bigger audience or a bigger market, not necessarily a bigger, a bigger audience. It's, the, uh, it's a good example here that I, that I like to give often. It's Starbucks. Starbucks started as a specialty coffee shop, but they soon realized that there aren't that many people who have the disposable income to shed on uh, organic coffee every mm -hmm. day. Also, uh, not that many people are into diving deep into, you know, a bitter drink. <laughs> so they turned their business in, into something that's not exactly coffee. No coffee aficionado will ever say, hey, the, uh, the Starbucks drink is the <laughs> Um, yes, but they they now appeal to the masses. They they have an IPO because they appeal to the masses. If your goal is to to get to IPO level, you need a very very broad audience. You have to Someone kind of do this to... branch out. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So as I was asking you the question about audience and saying that a lot of the businesses that I run into don't really have their audience clearly defined. There's something that I like to say, and that is there's never been a better time to be in business because of the tools that we have at our disposal, because of social media, because of the reach that we have the opportunity of having these days, that there's never been a better time to be in business. However, having said that, I see lots of individuals popping up going, I see people making tons of money using content creation, using social media. I can do that. And so they hop into it, but they haven't really fleshed out the business side of things. You know, do you, do you ever run into that? I see a lot of people jumping in, not to just be on, to be on social media for period, but then to like, I could, I could make money by creating content about this business. And so yeah, have you I, ever run into that? Yes. Uh, and I want to preface this by by saying that it is indeed a, a very good time to be in business because the entry barrier is very low. But on the other hand, we have to take into account that every time the entry barrier is low, the growth barrier is towering. So it's very easy to uh, get on social media. All you need is a free account. Anyone can do that. But growing there and turning this into a lucrative business is a completely different story. And to answer your question, I see a lot of people who get lost in the vanity metrics. I'm the first one to tell you that the size of your audience matters a lot. It's why I'm actually building a course on building an audience right now. Okay. But it's not just about the size. It's also about the relevance. And it's about what you do with that audience. How do you get them to convert into, into buyers and into brand ambassadors? And I see this a lot with people who start off as content creators, as opposed to starting off as business mm -hmm. owners. Mm -hmm. They lose they lose sight of the business side of things. They uh, they focus on how many followers they have, how many views they have, how many tiny hearts they get be oh. <laughs> below every video and every photo that they post. And I get it. We, we're wired to like that. It's yes. those are tiny dopamine drips that feed our brains, but they don't feel our, feed our tummies. And that's a problem, you know, because they yes. they don't pay the bills. So when I when I work with the content creators who, who lose sight uh, 
of the business uh, of their business needs i have to remind them that everything you have everything you do every little piece of content that you create and that you publish online has to tie back to revenue can you tie this back to revenue okay sometimes you, you do something because you need a bigger audience but ultimately, the audience uh, that you get from that one post that maybe it's controversial, it's divisive, it's inspirational, has to have a correspondence with your ultimate business goal. And if you run a business, you know that the ultimate goal is always revenue. Mm -hmm. uh, it may sound cold and cruel, but the ultimate goal is revenue. Of course, we can talk about enjoying our work and having fun as we create content. Those are extremely important things because if you don't have a little bit of fun and you don't enjoy at all what you do, mm -hmm. you're going to stop doing it. And it's going to show. It's going to show that you're grinding your teeth and white knuckling it. Yes. Uh, but ultimately, you need to tie everything you do to revenue, to paying the bills, to keeping the lights on. Whatever you want to call it, that's where it has to go. You are a woman after my own heart because I preach that <laughs> as well. And there's so many, we could talk about this for the next two hours because there's so many <laughs> ways we meet people in this space. Sometimes they have a business and they want to promote it. Sometimes they're creating content and they want to create a business. Sometimes they're uh, just doing a hobby and they want to, they, th they think that by posting it on social media, they're going to make money. And so many times I'll ask, I'll look at someone's profile. They come to me for a consultation. I say, okay, I see that you have this, this and this and this going on. How do you plan, what's, what's your business? How do you plan to monetize it? And they go, hmm, I haven't thought about that. <laughs> and I'm going, okay, so, but what, what made you, let's just say it's YouTube. What made you want to be on YouTube in the first place? Well, I, I wanted to make money. I said, well, how do you think, are you, do you know? how people on YouTube are actually creating an income? No, not really. So sometimes with this social media, and especially when we start talking about influencers or full-time content creators, as I like to call them, you get the impression that they are living the high life, that they are making lots of money. Yeah. And you're like, oh, I can do that too. But you have no idea. First of all, that may not be true. They may not be making any money it's not very transparent and secondly you have no idea unless you're extremely savvy on digging through things to figure out what their estimated income might be and so i just that's a that's a point of frustration with me and that's one of the reasons why i wanted to bring this stuff to light in a podcast i want like i said this podcast is real talk about the business of content creation and we you and i since we're both on the business end, we're having lots of different conversations about audience and uh engagement and uh growth and but there's so much more to this it's easy entry like you said easy entry but not so easy to create an income from. Yes. One of my pet peeves is survivorship bias, where we only see the success stories. We see the people who take a photo shoot in a private jet. But some of us know that there are businesses who actually rent private jets by the hour, specifically for Instagram influencers who want to, uh, who want to depict a certain lifestyle, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. But... The reality is that just like in the startup world, 99% of people who start, they don't make it. Those are the stories you don't see. You don't see them on social media. You don't see them in the mainstream media. So we're kind of led to believe that everyone who, uh, who creates an account on Instagram, on YouTube, on LinkedIn, they're going to succeed. They will not. 99% of them will fail and they will fail because they don't think about the business side of things. And they expect, uh, they expect that they're going to succeed because this is what they see around them. But that's not the norm. The success stories, they are the outliers. They're not the, they're not the regular people. You know? I love that conversation about that term outliers because I know I can, I can look at a, a content creator and I can figure out who they're trying to emulate. I was like, okay. oh, you saw this person. And so you thought you would do this. And what I want to let you know is they are an anomaly. They are an outlier. Or perhaps sometimes it's they didn't start off doing what they're doing now. You're trying to meet them where they are. You're trying to be who they are now. 
That is not who they started off being. They started off providing value in this way, and then they became a, a known quantity, B-list celebrity, internet famous. And you're looking at where they are now and you're saying, I could do that. She went on yeah. her vacation and she showed me where she went on vacation and she showed me what she ate today. And why is it, <laughs> why am I not getting the same kind of, you know, followers, yeah. views and engagement that she's getting. And they don't know the journey or they don't understand that that is an anomaly. That's an outlier. And Absolutely. And this is very damaging when you're trying to build this kind of business because you're inevitably com uh, comparing your, your pilot episode to someone else's third season. And this comparison has no winners. You're not going to win by, by making this comparison. Absolutely. Absolutely. And comparison is really tough. As a content creator, uh, I don't know if you deal with this. I deal with it sometimes too, when I am like, even as something like writing a newsletter or writing a blog post, I'm looking at another uh, content creator who's in my niche. It's like, oh, there's just so much better than mine. Oh, or their post, their feed looks better than mine. You know, it's easy to uh, compare yourself to others who are in this industry who may have been at it a lot longer than you are you have and one thing i'd like to say about getting started is that nobody's that great at the very beginning unless they have a background in this stuff oh, yeah. especially on camera yeah nobody is that great i like to show the creators that i work with the first videos that some of the biggest creators on the internet ever made Gary oh, V, yeah. like Marcus Brownlee, like uh, Mr. Beast even, you know, it's like, do you understand where these people came from, where they were and how they had to just keep showing up, looking crazy, sounding crazy, bad lighting. No, <laughs> you have to start there. You can't wait until you're perfect to show up. Absolutely, absolutely. Because I mentioned survivorship bias recently, had I went on a bout where I started questioning LinkedIn creators who claimed that uh, they rose to fame within six months to a year. And I've been in marketing for 17 plus years, and I can tell you this game is tough. Six months is not enough to become semi-famous uh, internet personality. So I mm -hmm. started asking some questions. What did you do before, uh, before you started doing this? What was your support system? Because a lot of people claim that uh, I was jobless, I was cashless, and then three months later, here I am making 10K plus a month. Every time the answer was either um, I worked in marketing, I was a VP of sales, I, uh, I had a supportive partner, I had a war chest that I could rely on until I built my, uh, my next cash flow. And these are the, the context part of the stories that people don't see because they, they want their content to be inspirational. Here's my fancy trip to Santorini. Really. This, uh, this villa that I rented for the night cost as much as your food budget for the entire month. <laughs> You'll never be able to afford it, but you still like looking at it. But they don't tell you that maybe it's a brand deal. Maybe, <laughs> maybe it took them 10 years to get to rent that, that, uh, that villa, you know? And you always need to, to look at the context, to look at where they, they started. That's why... I loved it so much when you said that you, you show people the first videos of famous creators. They started in a completely different place than they are now. And some of them also had uh, an unfair advantage, uh, a background that helped them somehow. These are the things you don't usually see in media. You don't see the, the luck that played, the, uh, the part that luck plays into most of these careers. There are a ton of things that you cannot replicate. You can do the same plating that someone on Instagram has for their brunch. But mm -hmm. that's not going to, uh, to get you the same number of, uh, of views and no. shares. No, and I am recognizing that so much. And I talked about my client who uh, has grown her, her Instagram and her TikTok for her business. But uh, one thing I will say about her is that although she had zero social media presence at all, not even a personal Facebook page, once she got started, she said, this is just marketing. And she did have a marketing background from years ago, you know, exactly. she's taken time off and raised her kids, but her previous career 20 years ago was in marketing. And once she just, once it clicked for her to say, this is marketing. Now, 
-hmm. Not all creators, even business creators, have that ability or have that cheat code or have that knowledge so that when I'm working with creators, I kind of have to explain that to them and kind of explain how marketing works. And then they get it. But it is, um, I love that you said that some creators, you're talking about LinkedIn, how they kind of, they, pe some people have an unfair advantage. That's just life. That's just how it is. Some people yeah. have money to put behind their businesses. They have money to hire people to help with uh, content creation. Even the people who work with you and I have an income so that they can pay us to help them with their journey. That's a, yeah. that's a little bit of an advantage other than people who just learn the stuff on their own and, and bootstrap it. It took me a year of doing research to learn how to take the channel that I manage to a million followers of every day, researching, researching, researching. Anyone can do that if you have the time, but yeah. you can also pay me to shortcut that for you and give you the only the information that you need that's important for you to, to see that transition and make, make that change. So I just, I it, this is just such an interesting conversation for me that, uh, we Thank have different I, perspectives. <laughs> no, I, I love what you said about, uh, about how you how you uh, build shortcuts for your clients because the truth is everything has a price tag and you pay for things with time or money. If you if you don't have money, you're, you're going to pay for it with time and vice versa. The sad thing is that people often pay with what they value less, and even sadder is that that's usually time. So mm -hmm. it's sad because. Money is not uh, is not finite. Time is. Yeah. So if you prefer to go down the rabbit hole and spend 13 hours on YouTube just researching how to do a perfect thumbnail, you you can go for it. Uh, <laughs> but there are but there are better ways. It's it's what I what I tell my clients, and I see this in my in my strategy sessions with them. More often than not, they know what they need to do, but they uh, they read so much junk online and so much contradictory advice that they uh, they don't know what to believe anymore. So they need someone to, to give them the confidence to just stick to something and to build a roadmap for them that they're going to stick to. Because if you, if you want to do everything on your own, you're going to suffer from shiny object syndrome. You're going to see that it, this creator recommends YouTube. So you're going to start a YouTube channel, but then someone else says TikTok is easier to monetize. So you jump on TikTok. But hey, Instagram reels are back. Why not throw in a couple of reels as well? So sometimes you just need a you just need a voice to tell you to stick to your path and give it a chance. Give it three months. Give it six months before you decide to pivot to something else. Yes, yes, I love that. That's my favorite part of coaching is to give that encouragement to keep going and to let them know, no, you're fine. You're fine. Just keep moving in that direction. I have clients that tell me, oh my goodness, I only, nobody's watching. I only got this many likes. I only got this many views. Just keep going. Keep going. You're doing the right thing. You're not, this is not going to happen overnight. And I think they just need that reassurance to know that it's okay. Absolutely. It's going to be okay. It is. And if nobody's watching, then get all the mistakes out of your system. Yes. Get up as, <laughs> as often as you can. No one's watching. <laughs> Uh, it's what I did when I, when I started appearing in podcasts. I love to write and I still believe that uh, I'm smarter in writing than on video. But uh, I said yes to any podcast, any podcast host who asked me to, uh, to come on their podcast. I said yes. Is it a brand new podcast for someone that has absolutely no audience? Of course, I'm, I'm going to learn how to <laughs> how to be on video. Yeah, but but you're internet famous here that your podcast yeah. is brand new you are not yeah. these days i can afford to be a bit more selective because uh i don't sound like i'm really scared of my host and i don't know what to say anymore <laughs> that is so funny because um that's what people say they say well i don't because i it's like girl make the video nobody's gonna see it nobody's gonna mm -hmm. see it when I came back to YouTube after a hiatus, because I've worked behind the scenes for years and I didn't have to make my own content. I am, I am teaching and coaching based on the work that I do on another channel. But as I'm starting to work with business owners, I have to talk the talk, I have to walk the walk. So I have to get in front of the camera. When I came back to getting in front of the camera, I was struggling so much and suffering so much that I created an entire video. I think I had on this shirt, 
and it was on backwards. <laughs> My shirt was on backwards during the entire podcast. And I mean, the entire okay. video. And I said, you know what? It's going up because only 200 people are going to see this video and they all know and love me anyway. They don't care. <laughs> Get those mistakes out and of the way. And this is real life. Maybe five or seven years ago, I was talking to a partner about building a course on copywriting. And all I had to do was record a promo where I say, Hi, I'm Adriana Tika, and this is what we're going to do in this course. It took me seven tries to get my name right. There was no one else. It wasn't a live stream. It was just me and the camera trying to record a 20 second promo. I forgot my own name. So <laughs> I, I was really, really camera shy. And it takes a lot of practice to, to get to a comfortable space where you can express yourself uh, without constantly thinking, oh my God, what are they going to think about me? Is my, is my hair okay? Um, am I gesturing too much? What am I doing here? You know? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I struggle with that thing. My first TikTok took me all day, all day long. It was during COVID. I had rented some space uh, at WeWork and I wanted to do a TikTok promo. It took me all day. I'm talking seven hours. I didn't know what I was doing, <laughs> but you get better. Practice makes perfect to get better. Yeah. And, uh, I'm hoping, hoping that this whole podcast interview is an encouragement is informational, informative, and helpful to content creators and business owners alike. So I okay. want to know, uh, any closing thoughts you have about this subject matter and where my audience can find you, how they can work with you and just where they can find out more about you. The best piece of advice I, I give my clients is to, is to start with the things that don't scale. This is actually Paul Graham's advice and it's for startups, but it applies to any kind of business. Start with the things that don't scale. Start talking to your ideal customers. And I mean, one-on-one -on -one conversations, not conversations at scale. Do the, I don't know, the 100 videos you need to do before you get a perfect video that goes yes. viral. <laughs> um, Start practicing writing if, if writing is something that, that you want to lead with in your, in your content creation journey. Always, always assume that the, the growth hacks that you see online are just that, growth hacks. By the time that they get popular, that everyone peddles them, they're snake oil. They're nothing more than snake oil. You need a solid foundation for your business before you think about the growth hacks. If you have a solid foundation for your business, you're going to know which hacks apply to you and which don't. I, I talk a lot about uh, building a sustainable business that will feed you for years to come, as opposed to a one-hit wonder. In my weekly newsletter, it's called I Use to Power Your Future, and you can find it at adrianatica.com. And this is also the website where you can find a couple of ways to work with me one-on-one. -on -one. Awesome. Well, I will be sure and put all of your links in the description of this video where people can find you. I have so much enjoyed talking to you. I would love oh, to uh, just stay in touch and continue this conversation. And um, so thanks for being here. Thank you too, Tony. It was a pleasure.